I do. It is a privilege to be here this morning, and uh, we've been looking forward to this time. And I know that uh, we've been praying for you, and you've been praying for us. So we appreciate the prayers and all that uh, uh, God has for this church, and we're just being sensitive to his leading in all areas of our life, and I trust that as a church that we will uh, continue to keep our eyes upon him during this time. Amen. Um, and I count it a privilege and a great responsibility to stand before you this morning uh, as a candidate. And uh, I trust that as you look up here today that you would not be seeing me, but that you'd be seeing Christ through me. And that's my prayer today. And so I, I trust that you've come prepared to hear from God through the message today and what he has prepared for each one of us today. As you're finding your way to Luke chapter 17 this morning, and while you're turning, I would like to say just a few words to introduce this uh, text this morning, the message. I had the privilege of attending as well as graduating from West Coast Baptist College there in Southern California. I think back to the semester of 2001, which would have been my last year at the college. And although it was my last year at the college, it was actually the first year of my younger brother, John. I can remember very on in that first semester that many of the students were getting employment in the local area to help pay their way through their, through their school years. And John was fortunate to secure a job very quickly. Really, in just a few weeks of being there, he was able to get a job. And unlike a lot of the students and incoming freshmen, John was also fortunate to bring his own car to, to school that year. It was a 1986 Volkswagen GTI. That year, I lived in a dorm off camp campus, which was only really a mile from the main campus. Directly east of my dorm was a very busy intersection but one that no doubt that many students came to on a, on a daily basis. One particular afternoon, after finishing his classes for the day, John headed out to go to his new job. Still somewhat unfamiliar with the area, John came to this very busy intersection and by mistake thought it was a four-way stop. Unfortunately, not realizing that it was only a two-way stop, he proceeded to go and seemingly out of nowhere was T-boned by a semi going at a high rate of speed. John, inside that little GTI hatchback, was put into a tailspin that flung his car several hundred feet right into a telephone pole. As the police and paramedics were arriving on the scene, they witnessed firsthand the horrific accident scene and the unrecognizable vehicle, expecting to find a deceased body inside. But what they discovered was that no one was in that mangled vehicle that day because my brother John was able to pull himself out of that vehicle unharmed and in no need of medical attention. As the deputies looked at that little hatchback vehicle wrapped around that telephone pole, they said, whoever was in that vehicle should have been dead. There's no way that they could have just walked out. And then they said this, it's a complete miracle. And they would be absolutely right because to this day there's no reasonable explanation as to how my brother could walk away from such a freak accident except to say it was a miracle from God and the angels were watching over him that day. You see, a miracle has been defined and is a work wrought by a divine power for a divine purpose by means beyond the reach of man. Webster very simply defines a miracle as an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. And many of you in this building this morning have experienced something firsthand in your life that would be characterized as a miracle, something that transcends the very laws of nature, something that cannot be explained, something that is so spectacular that it can only be attributed to the all-powerful work of God. And as you read the pages of Scripture, you will discover the numerous accounts of what we would describe and associate as miracles. If we look into the Old Testament, we find the manna that came from heaven was a miracle. The crossing of the Red Sea was a miracle, the burning bush, the walls that fell at Jericho, Daniel in the lion's den, the three men in the fiery furnace. The fact that Sarah would get pregnant at the age of 90, that's a miracle. And, and many of the ladies would say, oh, help us this morning. But we think of Sarah getting pregnant at the age of 90. That's a miracle. The miracle of Jonah in the belly of a great fish, and the list goes on. We look into the New Testament where we find Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, where he healed the woman with the issue of blood, raising Lazarus from the dead, making the dumb to speak and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk again, just to name a few this morning. 
we realize that the accounts of miracles in the Bible are endless. And this morning we come to Luke chapter 17 where we see firsthand once again how the Lord Jesus continued to bring amazement to anyone and everyone he came into contact with. So follow along in your Bibles beginning in verse number 11 as I read Luke chapter 17 and verse number 11. And it came to pass as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. I just love this portion of Scripture, for we find once again an amazing miracle and demonstration of divine power from our Lord. If you've not figured it out already, Jesus never met a need that he overwhelmed him. He never encountered a problem that he couldn't solve. He never faced a disease that he couldn't cure. And may I remind you this morning that Jesus has not changed. He sees your need today. He recognizes the problems that you face, the times of difficulty that maybe be in your life. Jesus wants to be that miracle worker in your life and make your faith real and alive once again. But he doesn't just want to prove who he is and what he can do for you. He desires to develop a response in each one of us that is so beneficial to our lives as his children as we follow him. A response that unfortunately we tend to overlook and forget all too often. You see, the miracle before us this morning that we will be examining is very peculiar and it's interesting in how it applies to us personally today. You see, this morning I believe that we will discover as Christians that we today need a new perspective. We need a new appreciation for the God that we serve, a greater response of worship in regards to the Jesus and all that he's done for us. So the title of my message very simply is echoed by the words of our Lord, but where are the nine? And from our text this morning, I want us to examine three key aspects that draw our attention back to the awesome privilege and priority of our personal worship and praise that God so desperately desires of his children. I see, first of all, and I would like you to notice the condition of the lepers. In verse number 12, the Bible says, And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Jesus, we find, while on his way to Jerusalem, that he passes through this town or village on, on his way through Samaria and Galilee. And as he enters this particular town or village, he's met by ten men, the Bible tells us. Really a group of ten mystery men, we would like to call them, because we don't know a whole lot about these guys. They may have come from completely different backgrounds, different ages. They maybe didn't really know each other very well, but there was something that they all had in common, and that was that they were all lepers. We see, first of all, their disease. You see, in this time in history when Jesus walked the earth, leprosy was the number one feared disease known to mankind. It was a horrible disease that brought on years of physical suffering. You see, leprosy would begin with little white spots appearing on the skin. Those spots would begin to harden and turn to, from white to pink, then to brown, and become very scaly on the skin. Those sores then began to spread all over the body. They would affect the face first. Soon the appearance of the face would change. These sores would begin to fill with pus and they would begin to form spongy-like tumors over the entire body while at the same time attacking the internal organs. The eyebrows would fall out and then the hair would turn white. Because the nerve endings would die, victims of leprosy couldn't tell whether their hands or feet were being harmed and after a while parts of their body would literally just die off and fall away. In the plainest of terms, a person with leprosy was rotting away. There was a foul odor of leprosy that it produced. 
And others even couldn't stand the awful stench. Leprosy was extremely contagious. Leprosy had no cure, and to be diagnosed with leprosy was essentially a death sentence to an individual. Some even referred to lepers as the walking dead. So we not only see their disease, but we also see, the Bible says, their distance. The Bible tells us in verse 12 that they stood afar off. And this was for a reason, you see, because leprosy was a very contagious disease. Lepers were required to live in social isolation out of fear that the leprosy would spread and infect others. The law required them to keep a legal distance of 100 feet or more. They would have to tear their garments so people would recognize that they were lepers. They would have to wear a cloth over their mouth so they wouldn't spread contamination. Sound familiar? If someone who was not a leper approached them, the leper was required to cry out, unclean, unclean, stay away, unclean. They were social outcasts. They were shut off from their family, their friends. They could no longer go to the temple for worship. Think of the humiliation that they felt. Imagine children coming up, pointing their fingers at you and saying, why does he look like that? And then running in fear. Can you imagine everyone turning in disgust when they saw you? You would have to rely on the pity of people in order order to have food to eat. And this is how these ten lepers went about their days. People would see them and take a totally different path to avoid them. Maybe saying under their breath, please don't touch me. Please don't come near me. Please don't even, please don't even uh, come in my presence. I don't want to get what you have. Think with me this morning what it must have been like to live with this awful disease. These lepers were experiencing firsthand the shame and rejection from everyone around them. And that their situation was only getting worse with each day that passed. So not only do we see their disease and their distance, but we also see their desperation. When we think of the horror and the hopelessness of leprosy, it's not hard for us to imagine how desperate these lepers must have been. Can you imagine their pain today? Can you imagine their loneliness, their sadness, their grief? Think about what they had lost in their lives. They no longer felt the touch of their loved ones. No more holding hands, no more hugs, no more kisses. No more being able to hold their children. No more I love yous. You see, they were isolated from their own kids and possibly grandkids and from their spouses and families. They they were cast away to die an agonizing, lonely death. Can you imagine their desperation? Their only hope was to be miraculously cured of their leprosy. Somehow, some way, they had heard of Jesus and the miracles he had performed. Perhaps... Someone had told them about what Jesus did for blind Bartimaeus. How he healed the woman with the issue of blood. Perhaps how he made the lame to walk, the deaf made to hear, and the dumb to speak. Maybe they heard about how he raised people back to life. Perhaps how he fed the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fish. If he could do all that, they might have said, maybe, just maybe, he could cure our disease. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up, and he appears to be coming in their direction. So instead of crying out, unclean, unclean, stay away, they cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Look at verse 13, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. All who have studied this terrible disease tell us that the damage to the vocal cords is also one of its major symptoms. So with their poor and feeble voices from a great distance away, They lifted up their voices with everything they had, with all their might, and with unison, they cried out together, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus, the Bible tells us, hears them. So we see the awful condition of the lepers this morning, but I want you to notice, secondly, the compassion of our Lord. Verse 14 says, And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest." And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus is on the move here through this village, and as he is passing by, the Bible says, he notices over in the distance a leper colony of these ten men, waving at him emphatically with their stumps that used to be hands, with their crippled and deformed arms. Some of them may be helping the others stand up as they're yelling from a great distance, trying to get Jesus to see them. And we see that the Lord Jesus notices them. 
And even though they couldn't come to Jesus because of the distance, the Bible says that he went to them. He comes to them in their greatest hour and their greatest need and in their desperation. We notice two acts from the Lord in verse 14. First of all, we see his command. He tells them this, go show yourselves to the priest. It's interesting that Jesus never touched them as he had done maybe on previous occasions in miracles of healing. He simply said, go. There was an act of faith in Jesus' command for healing. In other words, believe you are healed. But they were probably thinking to themselves, well, we're still standing here in front of Jesus and the people that were maybe there. We're still deformed. We're still smelly. We still have the disease from what we can see. They look at each other and say, did he say go to the priest? They acknowledge, well, yes, that is exactly what Jesus said to do. But they had to decide, each one for themselves, right at this very moment, if they would do what the Lord had told them to do. So each one of them make the decision to start their journey to go to the priest. And as they start out on their journey, all of a sudden things begin to change. Things begin to happen. We see the second act from the Lord is his cleansing. Verse 14 once again says, and as they went, they were cleansed. You know, I just love this phrase, as they went, they were cleansed. What a powerful and significant phrase. Because as the lepers went, as soon as they began the journey, things start to change. They start to feel the healing power of Jesus. Their fingers are being restored. The sores start to disappear. Their faces are starting to rejuvenate and return back to normal. They're looking at each other in amazement and pure joy. Right before their very eyes, they're literally being completely healed as they follow the Lord's instruction. The cleansing power of Jesus is at work, amen? Often in the Bible, we see that the disease of leprosy was symbolic. And it was symbolic of this, for it was a picture of the disease of sin in our lives. Just as leprosy was a death sentence to a life physically, sin is a death sentence to a person spiritually. For the wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us in Romans 6.23. Also in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Oh, I'm here to say today that because of my sin, I was sick. I was rotting away inside. I was desperate. I was alone. I was kept at a distance from Jesus because of the sin that separated me. And in my sinful flesh, I was completely hopeless. I needed a healer for my sin-sick soul. There was nothing I could do on my own. I think back to the summer of 1993 at a youth camp. On a Tuesday night at the age of 14, I heard an evangelist preach that night on the cross and how Jesus loved me so much that he was willing to suffer and die in my place so that I could be forgiven of my sins. Thankfully, when I realized my sinful state, I called out to Jesus that night in my greatest need, the need for salvation. I cried out, Lord Jesus, save me. And I followed his promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, and I'm so glad he heard my cry. I'm so glad I've been cleansed today. I'm so glad my life has been made brand new by the power of the cross and the finished work of Jesus The chains of sin have been broken. I've been given new life in Christ. Can I ask you today, how about you? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been to Calvary? Have you been to the cross and met Jesus there? Have you accepted Christ and what he's done for you? Have you placed your faith in Jesus for your salvation? Can you remember a time and a a place where you ask Jesus to come into your heart and life. Oh, I want to challenge you today, if you can't remember a time, if you can't remember a place, today would be a great day to do that. Imagine the scene here as these guys looked at each other and maybe said to one another, hey, look at your skin. Look at your skin, it's new. It's clean. There's no sores, there's there's no sign of disease. And the other says, well, so is yours. And as they look at their hands and they see the color and Life returned to their body. They almost can't believe it. Can you just see them maybe jumping up and down? Maybe hugging one another in pure celebration that they've been healed? And you know when you first come to Jesus and you realize how he's healed your sin-sick soul? 
that he's freed you from the bondage of sin. It is exciting. It's amazing. You just want to tell everyone what Jesus has done for you and the change Christ has made. These ten lepers are rejoicing, and all of a sudden it hits them. We've been changed. We've been physically transformed. We no longer are required to live in physical distance and isolation. We have families back home, wives, children, grandkids. They've been longing for their loved ones' embrace. They thought they would never be able to see their families again, but now things are different. Jesus has completely transformed their life. So maybe they've run at full sprint to share the good news with everyone back home. All but one, the Bible tells us. For we find, last of all today, the choice of the leper, verses 15 through 18. Let's read it once again. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face and his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. We notice here that just one, just one of the cleansed lepers stops dead in his tracks. Instead of going back to his family, he turns back and says, I must go back and give glory to Jesus and give thanks for this great miracle of healing and for his mercy upon my life. It's amazing to me that as we read the account here, that only one out of all ten came back to give glory and thanks to Jesus. I mean, they'd all experienced the same life-altering miracle at the hands of Jesus. Why only one? Were they not all grateful? Well, I believe that they were all grateful. I'm sure they were all grateful for what had just happened. I mean, immediately their life had been transformed. Their life had been changed. But we find that only one was truly thankful. You see, thankfulness is a verbalization of that for which we are grateful for. One came back to give thanks. But before we lash out, before I condemn the other nine, I have to stop and remember everything that Jesus has done for me in my life. Everything that I've failed to recognize and pause to give him glory and praise for. These lepers, these nine, that went on their way had just experienced a miracle from the Lord and to think that they didn't even stop to say thank you to Jesus. But you see, you and I wake up in a world of miracles each day. Every time we take a breath to use oxygen and incorporate it into our body, that's a miracle. Every time we open our eyes and take in all the beauty around us, that's a miracle. Every time we see a baby brought into this world, that's a miracle. Every time we take a bite of food and put it into our mouth and chew it and our body digests it and uses it for energy, that's a miracle. You see, just as surely as it was a miracle when God parted the Red Sea, just as surely as it was a miracle when Jesus fed the 5,000, just as surely as it was a miracle when Jesus healed a blind man, and just as surely as it was a miracle when Jesus healed these ten lepers, we wake up in a world of miracles every day. And many of us have the audacity to take them all for granted. Do you know what happens to us when we fail to give glory to God for the miracles in our life? We get spoiled. We begin to expect them to happen. We take God for granted. We take this life for granted. We start to focus on the wrong things. We tend to think about the blessing more than the blesser. We tend to think about the gift more than the giver. We think about the healing more than the healer. We think about the provision more than the provider. We think about the saving more than the Savior. Oftentimes, we're quick to accept all the benefits that come to us in our Christian life and then easily forget the one who gave it to us. James tells us in chapter 1 and verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father. We need to say like David today in Psalms 118, verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. May I remind you what you've been blessed with in this life is not because of you, it's because of Him. And oftentimes we don't even recognize how blessed we are until it's taken away. Our power goes out and suddenly we're thankful for electricity. Our water heater breaks and instantly we realize what a blessing it is to have hot water. Our car breaks down and we get stranded on the side of the road and suddenly we realize how we take our working car for granted. A good friend dies and immediately we realize how maybe we took their friendship for granted. I believe that oftentimes we tend to focus on all the things in life that we want instead of thanking God for what we have. 
A little boy wanted $100 very badly. He prayed and prayed for weeks, but nothing happened. So he decided to write a letter to God requesting $100. When the Postal Service received the letter marked God, USA, they decided to send the letter to the president. The president was so amused that he instructed the secretary to send the little boy a $5 bill. The president thought this would appear to be a lot of money to a little boy. And the little boy was delighted with the $5 bill right when he got it. He sat down and to write a thank you note back to God. The post office once again forwarded the letter onto the president, which read, Dear God, thank you very much for sending the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you sent it through Washington, D.C., and those guys deducted $95 in taxes. <laughs> And many of you would say this morning, oh, that's the truth. Those crooks over there taking our money. But you know what? I'm thankful for the taxes I pay because it means I'm employed. I'm thankful for dishes that need washed because it means I have food to eat. I'm thankful for a lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, a floor that needs swept because it means I have a house to live in. I'm thankful for the only space at the far end of the parking lot because I'm able to walk. I'm thankful for my enormous electric bill in the middle of the summer because it means I have AC. I'm thankful for the alarm that goes off early in the morning because it means I have another day of life to live. A little eight-year-old named Christina had a rare cancer of the nervous system. When asked what she wanted for her birthday, she thought long and hard and finally said, I don't know. I have two sticker books and a Cabbage Patch doll. I have everything already. Is that your attitude today? God, I have everything. You're so good to me. What more do I need? In verse 17, we see where Jesus said, were there not ten clans, but where are the nine? When Jesus asks a question here, you can just sense the sad disappointment in his voice for the ones who failed to return. By failing to return, they indicated that they were focused more on their lives and on themselves than on the one who healed them. Oh, sure, the other nine had faith to be healed, but I believe their faith stopped there. They missed the opportunity to truly worship Jesus by offering their praise for all that he had done for him and for them. I'm afraid that so many of us oftentimes are more like the nine than we are the one. We often forget to simply take time to stop at a blessing, to stop and worship at the feet of Jesus for a while. I would like to close today with, a, with this story. Well, on a short-term mission trip, Pastor Jack Hinton from North Carolina was leading worship singing at a leper colony in Tobago. There was time for one more song, so he asked if anyone had a request. A woman, a woman who had been facing away from the pulpit turned around. He said it was the most hideous face I had ever seen. The woman's nose and ears were entirely gone. The disease had destroyed her lips as well. Despite her appearance, however, she lifted a fingerless hand in the air and asked, Can we sing Count Your Many Blessings? Overcome with emotion, the pastor had to leave the service. He was followed by a team member who said, Well, pastor, I guess you'll never be able to sing that song again. Yes, I will, he replied, but I'll never sing it the same way. Count Your Many Blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. Oh, my friend, today, may I ask, what has God done for you? What does Jesus mean to you today? This one leper couldn't wait to come to the feet of Jesus and to express his thanks and worship the Lord for all that he had done for him. How about you this morning? Oh, I believe that many of us that are here today are fully aware of all the blessings that we have. And we are aware who ultimately gives them to us. And yes, we may be grateful for them today as well, but are you truly thankful? When is the last time you took time to express your thanks to God? When's the last time you really got down on your knees before God and said, just like this Samaritan leper, Lord, you are so good to me. Lord, I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve your mercy. And today, if you've taken this life for granted, and you've not given God the worship and the praise and the glory that he deserves that maybe today when the invitation is given, you just need to come down to this altar this morning and pour your thanks and your heart out to God. He's absolutely worthy of that this very hour. If you're here this morning, you might say, 
I've never experienced the cleansing power of salvation for my soul and life. Then Jesus invites you today to come and be forgiven. If you're not sure where you will spend eternity when this life is over, you can get that settled today. So may I challenge you to please come and trust Christ this very day. Will you do it? As the Lord directs your heart and life today, allow him to have his way. And I trust that you will. Let's, let us pray. Lord, you are so good to us. And oftentimes as we go through this life, we are so guilty to take this life for granted. Lord, we have to be honest with ourselves that oftentimes we complain, we get disgruntled. We look around us and we, can, we, we get anxious and we worry about things of tomorrow instead of remembering the blessings of today. Lord, I pray that we would be like this one that returned, not like the nine that just went on their way to go about their life. Or we could come to a service like this today and we can be challenged to truly give you a spirit of thanks and express that. Yeah, Lord, I pray that you would do a work in each heart and life here today. With heads bowed and eyes closed today, no one looking around, you may be sitting there in your seat. You don't know for sure that heaven is your eternal home, but you want to know. You want to know for sure that when this life is over that you will be in heaven with Jesus and all those that have trusted him. Would you be willing to raise your hand so that I might pray for you today? Anyone at all in this, in this building today, if that's the need of your heart, if you know that there's never been a time, you can't go back to a place, you can't go back to a time where you called upon the Lord to save you. You say, Brother Phil, would you pray for me? Anyone at all? I see that hand. Thank you for raising that. I see this hand. Several. Anyone else? Say, I don't know that Jesus is my Savior. I don't know that Christ has forgiven me. Several hands. As the invitation is given, these hands that have been raised for salvation, I want to encourage you as we stand to sing that you would come to the front. Someone will be here to meet you. And if you're a young lady, a lady will take and, and, and pray with you. If you're a young man, a man will go with you and, and, and counsel with you. If that's the need of your heart today, don't put it off. I encourage you, do that today. I have one more question. How about you, Christian? Have you taken this life for granted? Have you been like the nine, failing to give God the worship and praise and the thanks that he deserves? You say, that's me. I've been guilty of it. I've been... Disgruntled Over the last 18 months, I find everything to complain about and everything that's wrong in this world. And I just need to get back to a place of thanks and praise for all that God has done in my life. If, that, if that's you today, would you raise your hand? Several hands. Today is a great day to rekindle that flame in your heart with the Lord to say, God, help me to remember all the blessings that you've given me. Lord, once again, we pray that you'd bless this invitation time. I pray that you'd break down the walls of, of maybe fear to, to deal with the, the matters of the hour. Lord, those that raise their hand for salvation today, I pray that they would step out, that they would come and accept this most wonderful gift that they could ever receive. Lord, as the invitation is given today, I pray that you would have your way.